The Art of War by Zan Zhu Chapter 1 Laying Plans Sun Tzu said, The art of war is of vital importance to the state. It is a matter of life and death, a road either to safety or to ruin. Hence, it is a subject of inquiry, which can on no account be neglected. The art of war, then, is governed by five constant factors to be taken into account in one's deliberations when seeking to determine the conditions obtaining in the field. These are 1. The Moral Law 2. Heaven 3. Earth 4. The Commander and 5. Method and Discipline the moral law causes the people to be in complete accord with their ruler so that they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any danger. Heaven signifies night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons. Earth comprises distances, great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes, the chances of life and death. The commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, sincerely, benevolence, courage, and strictness. By method and discipline are to be understood the marshalling of the army in its proper subdivisions, the graduations of rank among the officers, the maintenance of roads by which supplies may reach the army, and the control of military expenditure. The, these five heads should be familiar to every general. He who knows them will be victorious. He who knows them not will fail. Therefore, in your deliberations, when seeking to determine the military conditions, let them be made the basis of a comparison, and this wise. 1. Which of the two sovereigns is imbued with the moral law? 2. Which of the two generals has most ability, three, with whom lie the advantages derived from heaven and earth, four, on which side is discipline most rigorously enforced, five, which army is stronger, six, on which side are officers and men more highly trained, seven, in which army is there the greater constancy both in reward and punishment. By means of these seven considerations, I can forecast victory or defeat. The general that hearkens to my counsel and acts upon it will conquer. Let such a one be retained in command. The general that hearkens not to my counsel nor acts upon it will suffer defeat. Let such a one be dismissed. While heading the profit of my counsel, avail yourself also of any helpful circumstances over and beyond the ordinary rules. According as circumstances are favorable, one should modify one's plans. All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. 
Hold out beats to entice the enemy, feign disorder, and crush him. If he is secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he is, in, if he is in superior strength, evade him. If your opponent is of choleric temper, seek to irritate him. Pretend to be weak, that he may grow arrogant. If he is taking his ease, give him no rest. If it, if his forces are united. Separate them. Attack him where he is unprepared. Appear where you are not expected. These military devices leading to victory must not be divulged beforehand. Now the general who wins a battle makes many calculations in his temple ear the battle is fought. The general who loses a battle makes but few calculations beforehand. Thus do many calculations lead to victory and few calculations to defeat. How much more no calculation at all it is by attention to this point that I can foresee who is likely to win or lose. Chapter 2 Waging War Sun Tzu said, In the operations of war, where there are in the field a thousand swift chariots, as many heavy chariots, and a hundred thousand male-clad soldiers, with, prov with provisions enough to carry them a thousand li, the expenditure at home and at the front, including entertainment of guests small items such as glue and paint, and some spent on chariots and armor, will reach the, thou will reach the total of a thousand ounces of silver per day. Such is the cost of raising an army of a hundred thousand men. When you engage in actual fighting, if victory is long in coming, the men's weapons will grow dull and their ardour will be damped. If you lay siege to a town, you will exhaust your strength. Again, if the campaign is protracted, the resources of the state will not be equal to the strain. Now, when your weapons are dulled, your ardour damped, your strength exhausted, and your treasure spent. Other chieftains will spring up to take advantage of your extremity, that no man, however wise, will be able to avert the consequences that must ensue. Thus, though we have heard of stupid haste in war, cleverness has never been seen associated with long delays. There is no instance of a country having benefited from prolonged warfare. It is only one who is thoroughly acquainted with the evils of war that can thoroughly understand the profitable way of carrying it on. The skillful soldier does not raise a second levy, neither are his supply wagons loaded more than twice. Bring war material with you from home, but forage on the enemy. Thus the army will have food enough for its needs. Poverty of the state, a chaka, causes an army to be maintained by contributions from a distance. Contributing to maintain an army at a distance causes the people to be impoverished. On the other hand, the proximity of an army causes prices to go up, and higher, and high prices causes the people's substance to be drained away. When their substance is drained away, the peasantry will be afflicted by heavy exactions. With the laws of substance and exhaustion of strength, the homes of the people will be stripped bare and three-tenths 
of their income will be dissipated, while government expenses for broken chariots, worn out horses, breastplates and helmets, bows and arrows, spears and shields, protective mantles, drucked oxen and heavy wagons will amount to four tenths of its total revenue. Hence, a wise general makes a point of foraging on the enemy. One cart load of the enemy's provisions is equivalent to twenty of one's own, and likewise a single pickle of his provender is equivalent to twenty from one's own store. Now in order to kill the enemy, our men must be roused to anger. That there may be advantage from defeating the enemy, they must have their rewards. Therefore, in chariot fighting, when ten or more chariots have been taken, those should be rewarded who took the first. Our own flags should be substituted for those of the enemy, and the chariots mingled and used in conjunction with ours. The captured soldiers should be kindly treated and kept. This is called using the conquered foe to augment one's own strength. In war then, let your great object be victory, not lengthy campaigns. Thus it may be known that the leader of armies is the arbiter of the people's fate, the man on whom it depends whether the nation shall be in peace or in peril. Chapter 3 Attack by Stratagem Sun Tzu said, In the practical art of war, the best thing of all is to take the enemy's country whole and intact, to shatter and destroy it is not so good. So too it is better to recapture an, an, an army entire than to destroy it, to capture a regiment, a detachment, or a company entire than to destroy them. Hence to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. Thus the highest form of generalship is to bulk the enemy's plans. The next best is to prevent the junction of the enemy's forces. The next in order is to attack the enemy's army in the field. And the worst policy of all is to besiege walled cities. The rule is not to besiege walled cities if it can be possibly avoided. The preparation of mantles, movable shelters, and various implements of war will take up whole three months, and the piling up of mounds over against the wall will take three months more. The general, unable to control his irritation, will launch his men to the assault like swarming ants, with the, re with the result that one third of his men are slain, while the town still remains untaken. Such are the disastrous effects of a siege. Therefore, the skillful leader subdues the enemy's troops without any fighting. He captures their cities without laying siege to them. He overthrows their kingdom without lengthy operations in the field. With the forces intact, he will dispute the mastery of the empire, and thus, without losing a man, his triumph, triumph will be complete. This is the method of attacking by stratagem. It is the rule in war, if our forces are ten to the enemy's one to surround him, if five to one to attack him, 
if twice as numerous to divide our army into two. If equally matched, we can offer battle. If slightly inferior in number, we can avoid the enemy. If quite unequal in every way, we can flee from him. Hence, though an obstinate fight may be made by a small force, in the end it must be captured by the larger force. Now the general is the bulwark of the state. If the bulwark is complete at all points, the state will be strong. If the bulwark is effective, the state will be weak. There are three ways in which a ruler can bring misfortune upon his army. One, by commanding the army to advance or to retreat, being ignorant of the fact that it cannot obey. This is called hobbling the army. Two, by attempting to govern an army in the same way as he administers a kingdom, being ignorant of the conditions which obtain in an army, this causes restlessness in the soldiers' minds. 3. By employing the officers of his army without discrimination, though ignorance of the military principle of ad ad adaptation to circumstances, this shakes the confidence of the soldiers. But when the army is restless and distrustful, trouble is sure to come from other feudal princes. This is simply bringing anarchy into the army and flinging victory away. Thus, we may know that there are five essentials for victory. He will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. He will win who knows how to handle both superior and inferior forces. He will win whose army is animated by the same spirit throughout all its ranks. He will win who, prepared himself, waits to take the enemy unprepared. He will win who has military capacity and is not interfered with by the sovereign. Hence the saying, if you know the enemy, and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle.